Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. How are you, Dr. Mori? I'm fine. I yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. 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 You know, I told you that uh, I'm friends with uh, the Amores em in London. Yes, you said so. John yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John has been a very, very good big brother to me oh. since I came to this country. Yes, yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was in his office last week, last two weeks ago. Yeah, two, two weeks ago. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I used to, I used to, in fact, my, my company is uh, registered to his office. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, okay. that's, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Johnny. so, yes, Johnny, yes, it's a, it's a big, big, uh, big, big brother to me and many other people, you know. And yeah. uh, he's, he's uh, right. see, it, just like you, he's so active into so many different things, <laughs> you know. So when I see your dynamism, I mm -hmm. know, okay, it's a, it's a, a family thing. It's a family <laughs> thing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know. So, Helen, thank you very much for being here today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I know you have, you, you have something to do after this uh this hour with with me so let's let's start yeah so, so yeah that's why i wanted us to yes please uh please introduce yourself and tell my audience about you and what you do okay so i'm uh, helena more i'm an entrepreneur and i'm also a consultant and a lecturer so i work in different spaces. Sometimes I call myself a portfolio worker. Yes. Uh, but what I really do is I, I just enjoy, I'm at a stage in my life where I do only the kind of work I enjoy. And uh, so that's the privilege. Uh, I don't take it for granted. Yeah, so I, I do the kind of work that I enjoy. I think I'm ah, better. Mm -hmm. I do the kind of work that I enjoy. And it's for me, it's a privilege to be able to do the kind of thing I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the kind of space that I am in. So that's that's why I am. I just like helping people and okay. helping entrepreneurs to, okay. to do better. Yeah. Okay. You say you are a portfolio worker. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Okay. I know you are into so many different things, but <laughs> help me and help my audience to understand the the dynamism we are talking about. Okay, so what does that being being a portfolio worker mean? Okay, so I'm not into different things, um, but okay. it always comes across to people like that. That's because I have different clients. Mm, mm. But it's the same industry. What I do okay. is business development. Okay. Um, I do business development, and I also facilitate. I I facilitate. I work with Pan Atlantic University as an adjunct faculty where I teach business entrepreneurship. Okay. So I, because I work on several projects. Yeah. But I render the same service, service, it appears like I'm doing different things. No, I'm not doing a lot of things. Okay. I'm just rendering one service to different clients or customers. So I speak, I teach, and then I also consult. So, so that's why it looks like I'm always doing a lot of things. See, but I think that's one thing really. Which is yes, you, you do one thing, but with so many different clients. Okay. Yes. See, yeah. uh, I I was a banker. I I I'm not a banker. I was never a banker, but I used to work in banking. Okay. So that's different. Yeah. So I I worked in banking for about over a decade, and for maybe. Five years at the end of that, I was consulting for different banks. Okay. So the kind of projects I handle are different. Okay. And that's what I what I love about uh, about my 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 time in banking. I never did 
any one specific thing for a long time. Okay. Because I like doing different things. So tell us, what kind of clients do you consult with? And what kind of different projects have you been engaged in? So, so in recent times, I've worked mainly with uh, growing businesses. Okay. To advise them on how to grow their business, how to structure their organization, how to be ready for investments. Okay. So that's what I do most of the time because a lot of people run a business uh, sometimes by accident, sometimes as a retirement option from mm. uh, nine to five. However, there are different dynamics of running a business that uh, we assume we know, but yes. we don't know. <laughs> who, who has experience, expertise, and the knowledge guides you in looking at your business differently. Sometimes a different business model. Sometimes it could be just rethinking their product or offering. Sometimes they may be serving the wrong customers. You know, so my role as a business development um, consultant is to optimize whatever it is the, the customer has, meaning to help them get as much value as yeah. possible from what they are doing. So for me, that's what I, that's really this, it's, I like, I like to tell people that it's the same service that I render to different people. Yeah. And I have a specialization. So I'm working mainly in the agribusiness sector, okay. the creative industries, and then in secular businesses. And of course, all of them have to use technology anyway. Yeah. So that, that, those are the areas I work in. But I do a lot more with agriculture because that's the area where there's really opportunity. And also because uh, I have a farm and I've also run a food processing business. So ah. it's easy for me to use my experience and knowledge to guide businesses in such areas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See, you just told me, oh, I don't, I don't do many different things, but you just told me again, you have a farm, eh? And you, uh, hey, you do many different I things. I cannot <laughs> defund the farm because it was given to me by my dad. So okay. I, can't <laughs> I have no option. I have to keep it. But, but you know, the thing about being able to do um, portfolios is you don't give the same attention to everything at the same time. Yeah. Otherwise, you burn out. Yeah. You know? For me, I'm able to schedule my work and where I put my energy at different times of the year. So uh, that's how it's unraveling. And okay. it takes time to get to the okay. I, There's a particular time of the year I teach in the university and there are specific projects I work on. So I know when they are. Good. So yeah, really, I have an easy life, right? But <laughs> because I post a lot on social media, it looks like I'm doing a lot. Uh, but I believe it's also important that um, we share knowledge. Yeah. And that knowledge management is a huge challenge. A lot of people have knowledge and information and they die with it. Mm, mm. Uh, because they did not share. In the past, we didn't have social media. Yeah. But now that we have social media, we can share our knowledge. We can share the information we have. We can share our experiences so that other people can learn from it. Yeah. And maybe take a few things from it. People do all sorts of things. And for me, that's so good for, for us. I learn a lot from following other people too. So I, I believe it's only fair to allow other people to very also good. learn from me. That's that's good. That's very, very good. Now, see, having worked with different business people, what do you what have you what have you found as the most common challenge apart from money okay money is everybody has a money money issue okay to attract in, in, in investment but what other thing have you found is common with people who start businesses okay so i want to even start from money where you okay. say money is, money is not the issue. Oh, okay. So you think money is the issue. However, do you even know the business well enough? 
you know the ah. business well enough to be able to decide what kind of resources it requires. But more importantly is, do you know yourself mm. to know the kind of business you should be running? Because most times we are not in our sweet spots. We are not in what people call a Kigali. I think that's the, the, the <laughs> Japanese So You're not in that place where you're not doing a business where you are good at. A lot of people don't know their business. Because everybody has their business. The what, way what, does we that, are what does that mean? As, yeah, that's what I was going to explain. Okay. That the way we are wired as human beings, right? We all have special we have special characteristics. We have hmm. some things that we love to do. We have some things that we love to learn about, love to solve, you know. And when we when people come to us with such problems, we are happy, we are at our best. We are peak performers when we are doing what's a sweet spot. When you're in your sweet spot, you are a peak performer. You know, you know, there's this analogy where they say if you if you ask a fish to climb a tree, yeah. the fish will become inefficient, it will become yeah. useless. Yeah. Right? So it's the same thing for us as human beings. Sometimes some of us are fishes and we're trying to climb a tree in the desert. You will not <laughs> flourish. But if you put a fish in any body of water. It's yeah. going to give you its best. So, so that's the challenge we have as human beings. We have not, for me, as business owners, we don't, most of us don't even know what is our business. We just know that, oh, there's this opportunity. Okay, I had change of power now. Okay, okay. We just know that there's an opportunity or this business is profitable and you're doing it, but you're not happy. You're mm. doing it, but you're not happy. You may even be making money, right? Yeah. But you are still not happy. And you are wondering why. It's because that's not your business. So the first thing for me, whenever I'm engaging clients, is self-awareness. Do you know yourself? You know, do you know what you are good at? Do you know what you have? You know, there's also a principle called effectuation, okay. know, which says that we create and design the future we want as entrepreneurs. So I always encourage my entrepreneurs or people, I say, what future do you want? So when you ask them that, so what's your, what's your, what's your picture of your future self? They're like, ah, but we're talking about my business. Okay. So them, it is the picture of your future self that drives everything you do in this business. Very good. Because if you are not, if what you are doing does not align with your picture of your future self, you will struggle. In fact, you will hate the business. Every little thing you say, oh, this one is not working. Oh, this one is not working. Oh, this. I said, no, there's nothing wrong with the industry. There's something wrong with you. Yeah. 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 See? So that's where I start. For me, that's where I start from. Self-awareness and lack of knowledge of the dynamics of the industry that we operate in. Those, for me, those are the two, two challenges. Because if you look at the things you've been most successful at, you'll find that it's those things that you really, really were interested in. Yeah. Those things that you were very, very interested in, you were passionate about it, you wanted to fix things, you wanted to make a mark, you will go all out to look for knowledge, to look for resources. And once you have knowledge, half of the problem is solved. Because if you are going to go and look for money, you use the knowledge to present a good business case. However, yeah. if you're not knowledgeable enough, it comes true when you're talking. The holes will just be popping up from everywhere. So for me, that, that, that's where I always start. And I think those are the two, two greatest challenges we have as people. Yeah. We're not self-aware and uh, we just don't understand the dynamics of the space that we are operating in. Wow. You're so, so, so correct. See, uh, Self-awareness is a big deal with uh, all, most people, okay? Most of us do not know who we are, what we like, and uh, the truth is that we are not trained uh, as people to ask ourselves questions. And as adults, when a consultant or a coach like me, I ask the same kind of questions a lot, okay? And you ask 
someone that question they think you are prying mm -hmm. okay because the problem they, they brought to you was business and you're mm -hmm. asking them personal questions mm -hmm. and they don't they don't see the connection with that personal question with the solution or the 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 way that question will connect with the kind of solution they need see uh and it's it's not only us at individual levels the same thing happens at a national and community levels we need to ask we need to be comfortable to get and ask questions that may seem to pry because if we don't allow that kind of th these questions we, to be asked then we may not we may not ever find the real root causes of the of the problems we do we have in our in our lives so yeah you know thank you for that thank you for that how how have education uh and mentorship impacted your own pers personal journey to where you are today? Well, I, I, I grew up reading a lot. Um, yes, I, I, I know that. You're a PhD. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the PhD was a seed planted <clears throat> by my principal, because I remember then that I did very well in my Y. And um, when we went to collect my work results, I remember the principal telling my dad that, oh, it's your daughter, she did well. Please encourage her to go to PhD level. Wow. That my principal then was Dr. Ibibi. He was already a doctor. What, what, was, what school was that? He was in Abraka Grammar School. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, my dad just smiled, you know, but that thought never left my what he said, I, I mean, as I'm saying it now, I'm picturing him with his shirt, his tie, his trouser, and how he was telling my dad. I can still see him. Yes, in, in that that, that's one of your 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 early I mean, mentors. That was, yeah, that was a motivation for PhD. Mm. But as a, as a child, I I grew up reading. I, I went to a primary school where we had a live, very rich library. We were encouraged to read a lot. I we always used to go to the library to read. And my mom used to buy us books. So all through my childhood till I got to university, my parents always gave me allowance for books. So I wasn't a nerd, but I just enjoyed reading because it allowed me to paint pictures. I like yeah. painting pictures of different things, what, what, what I would like to happen. I was a very imaginative child. And um, so th that enabled me to study a lot. And so even as, uh, as a child, I, I had all sorts of pictures about myself as a lecturer, as a broadcaster, wow. as uh, someone who was speaking in international stages. And, you know, now that we're having this conversation, I'm like, oh, yeah. So I can safely say that everything I ever wanted to ever dream. It's coming true. Yeah. Don't do. Wow. Okay, so now I have, I'm creating new dreams for myself, right? So for me, I've always been a self, a self learner, and I've always been very imaginative. And I was also fortunate to meet different people at different times of my life who recognized the strengths that they thought I carried, that I didn't yeah. even know. And they drew my attention to it. And so that helped me to harness my strengths. Yeah. You know, so it, 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 it increased my level of self awareness, and I constantly am checking myself, I'm evaluating myself, and that has helped me a lot. So, having my own self driven learning, and then also having worked with very good people, very, I mean, very good people in my career, I've worked with ex, I mean, extremely wonderful people who were not afraid of sharing. You know, we're very generous with sharing knowledge. We're very generous with 
pointing me at what I should be doing. So I, I work with a lot more of such people that helped me, you know, to become who I am today. And of course, yeah. by the time I came into my own, it was easy to sort of, again, start creating the words I want in my mind and, and live my dream. Yeah. Wow. See, it's, uh, it's always wonderful when we have people in our lives that uh, encourages us. You know, your principal did a good a good thing by uh, highlighting the fact that hey, this young la lady has a uh, a great uh, potential uh, as a PhD, and that's great. And uh, yeah. He and this was at 16, you know. Yeah, yeah, I remember I was just 16 when he said that, so yeah, yeah. it's um, it's really yeah. I, and just one quick one, you know. I was that kind of person in secondary school mm. who, after the teacher has taught, I will teach some subjects, you know. <laughs> I, I was the kind of person in those days we should write a chalk, right? I would yeah, and they say, Oh, who will write the notes? So I would write. And by the time I was in form four, I would teach my colleagues, and sometimes they would say, Helen, come and explain to us. Okay. Let's hear your own explanation. You know, but it was for them, it was easier to understand my own explanation yeah. than yeah. the teachers do sometimes. Yes. You know? so, yes, yeah, yeah, good of them. Yeah, you know, so it helps too. Good. It helps. Good. T tell me, tell me. Uh, in your LinkedIn profile, you talked about uh, working with founders to tell their stories and uh, properly position their businesses for growth. Okay. So please tell us a little bit more about that, especially in the 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 importance of uh, storytelling in building and growing a, a business yeah story, storytelling is very important you see because uh what's a story is how you share experiences and knowledge and information okay. you know a story would always have a conflict and a resolution you know, there's something to be solved and there's a description of how it was solved. So business owners just get very familiar with their businesses that they don't think is a story worth selling. Mm. And especially for small and growing businesses, most times because they have higher aspiration, they sort of like undervalue their experiences and their businesses. So it doesn't bring out the full value in the business. You know, in branding, there's something called a brand equity. Yeah. So the value that a brand is worth, and that's very important. So it's, it's, it's dependent on what other people say about you. It's dependent on the perception of people about you. Yeah. So you have to tell your story in such a way that increases your brand value, that actually shows the intrinsic value of your organization, no matter how small the business is. Mm. You've got to have that value put out there the way it ought to be. But what we find is that people just don't even have it. They don't invest, they don't even know the worth of their value. They don't even know the value of their brand. They've not bothered to properly position their brand where it should be. Yeah. You know, it's like you go to a supermarket and you are selling premium um, conflicts. Or, yeah. And then you go and put it at the back, you go and put it near cat food. <laughs> you know, or something ridiculous. So I'm not really seeing the value that this is food I should be eating. Mm. It's, I'll say, oh, maybe it's not. It's not maybe it's cat food. Maybe it's conflicts. Yeah. Is it conflicts? Is it cat food? You are going to put it near cat food, right? So that's how it is with our businesses. Your business is a, a good brand. It's a premium brand. It's solving the problem. It's maybe saving the environment. It's helping children. Your, your, your business is about really helping humanity. 
in different dimensions. Yeah. But what do you do? You just say, oh, I sell food. Come and buy food. Okay. Yes. So, so I was saying that people need to be able to position their businesses properly so that they can get full value for it. Yes. That's number one. So first, your customers can know who you are. And people can know where to find you. Yeah. It's, it's like, I, I, I give an analogy. I say, look, today you tell me that you are living in Hendy. Tomorrow I'm looking for you. You tell me you are in Edgeware. Next tomorrow you tell me you are in Hackney. I'll be like, where, where exactly do you live? <laughs> yeah. And you say, oh, no, I'm with my brother in Hackney and with my cousin in, in Edgeware, but my house is in Hendy. Oh, really? So if I want to see you, where do I look for you? Yeah. Where should I always look for you? You now tell me that it depends. <laughs> so in the day there's an emergency. I'm looking for a guy who has a stable address. That's yeah. the same way with businesses. You know, today a business positions itself as um, fashion. Tomorrow it positions itself as a retail shop. Next tomorrow it positions itself as a beauty organization. Which one are you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that for me is um is a big challenge. So I, I tell people we must your story has to be consistent. Yeah. First define what you want to be to people. And then you can have different expressions, but you can't be everything to everybody. Yeah. You know, you should you should tell your story in such a way that even as an investor, I can see that oh okay, this person is a fashion entrepreneur. They want to grow these, and there are opportunities for them in another thing. As um, a customer, I will know that okay, every time I need a dress, I can come to you. However, I might find accessories there. Mm. Now that today I come to your shop, you have dresses. Tomorrow you have only accessories. Now, those are the kind of things business owners do. And that's actually the way they even position themselves. So the yeah. story is not consistent. Mm. And so I'm guiding one of the things that I'm doing is to tell people that, you know, what, get your positioning right. And they know how to tell your story in a way that amplifies your, it defines your brand, amplifies what you stand for, and then places a, a higher value on the solutions you are bringing to the market. Yeah. Then there's a way you tell your story that you are, you are coming across as a serious venture, not as a hustler. Mm. There are a lot of hustlers on social media, right? <laughs> and when you see them, you immediately know they are hustlers. But they don't think that they are, they are appearing like hustlers. They think they are smart. They think they are moving with the trends. So I'm teaching, I mean, I'm actually investing time and energy in training people how to tell their stories yeah in a way that makes sense in a way that builds their brands yeah oh it's, yeah, it's really very important yes it, it's important especially since many of us uh sell our, our goods or services on the internet you see on, on, until until the last 20 years uh only big corporations multinationals know what branding was right mm -hmm. now now that all of us are always on the internet hey i'm talking to you i'm i'm in uk you are in mm -hmm. uh in nigeria see we we do things more on the internet now we need to understand and position ourselves and our brand to be yeah so so we are telling uh, teaching people how to tell stories and i will tell you i need to learn that myself okay because i'm not good at i'm not i'm not good at it okay sometimes i avoid to tell my story <laughs> yes you know because uh i didn't start as a biz business person i was an, an employee for most of my of my uh working life so as a new business owner, I need to learn all these little, little things that, that increases the brand value of, of, of my business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So Africa, Nigeria, Africa has a lot of challenges. Okay. Now, what 
in your view, what are the biggest challenges that we face in Africa in this this century? Education. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the Bible yeah. says, the Bible yeah. says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay. Yeah. If you look at data and information out there, the most successful countries are those that have the highest literacy levels. And yeah. that's why you find that even countries like the United States of America, that is supposed to be the largest economy in the world, it is because of the level of illiteracy and low education in certain areas. Attainment. They would listen to a lot of propaganda. Yeah. And believe it as a Bible, gospel truth. So yeah. America is supposed to be number one, but their education is skewed. And then you now find that there are a lot of misinformed people. But look at a country like Netherlands, very small, high level of literacy, very egalitarian society where everybody seems to be doing well. They, yeah. they have their own world parties. And if you look across the world, the countries that have the higher education level and high quality of education, they tend to do better than countries that have... On, more, on, on average, yes. Yeah. Literacy. So for me... Our biggest challenge in Africa is education. And I've traveled around Africa a bit. I've been to quite a number of African countries, right? And I see the countries that are struggling. And you look, in fact, if anywhere in, in Africa, it could be Nigeria, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, it could as well be Nigeria. So if I travel, I'm really not scared about how to interact with the people because I'm there and I'm almost like I'm, I'm back home. Yeah. Problems are, the problems of Africa are the same. The same everywhere. For me, our biggest challenge is education. And then, you know, at the quality of political leadership we have across Africa. It's just the same. I just came back from, from a summit in Accra and there are women from all parts of Africa. And our problems are the same. And we ask, who is doing this to us? We are doing it to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, education and then the quality of political leadership is a huge challenge. But I believe that if we can improve on education, the quality of education we get, the access to information, the level of personal research that people are able to conduct, even in primary school, Africa will become a better continent because our quality of thinking will change. Right now, we externalize, we have an external um, focus, right? Yeah. We think that everything that happens is not our problem. Yeah. Or somebody else. Somebody, somebody's doing it. So exactly. We have an external locus. We, are, we always think that, hey, I can't do anything. Oh, you know, and so that's a big problem. Instead of saying, you know what, this is my future. I can decide what I want to be. I can work to be what I want to be. Sometimes I look at myself and I look at where I'm coming from and I'll say, well, how did I get from here to there? And I see that it's a journey mixed with different tons and tissues and then some roses that makes it look very bright and beautiful on the outside. So it's a journey, but I can think that way because I'm educated, I'm informed, I'm also learning, I'm trying to find out what's happening. Even now I'm not stopping because knowledge is so, so transient. Wow. Yesterday's knowledge is gone, things are changing. So we don't educate ourselves enough to even panic. Take a country like Nigeria now, when you turn on the radio, everybody's talking about the same thing. Oh, the first subsidy. Oh, devaluation. Meanwhile, in this country of 200 million people, there are still so many problems to be solved, so many things to be done, and people will pay for it. So why don't I think of how to make myself a person of value that people will want to pay for? 
and instead of allowing those fears or an anxiety to to weigh me down and then i can't think creatively because if we are going to be a successful continent we have to be innovating but what are we innovating so the problem of africa is for me i've narrowed it down to poor quality education we don't think we are not critical thinkers anymore so this person says this everybody goes to sleep and you're waiting for somebody else to come and solve the problem. There's a post that was trending on LinkedIn, um, Professor Che at LBS. He posted something to show that there are a lot of Lebanese and Chinese and Indians coming into Africa. And then Africans are crossing the sea to die. What's wrong with us? Okay. Wow. Wow. See me, um, I can't talk because <laughs> It's as if he just hollowed out my mind. Mm. See, if you if you check all the comments I make, I I don't comment in so many on so many posts, I, and I don't write a lot of posts myself. But this issue you just highlighted are the ones I'm most interested in because see young people say oh they don't want the second colonization mm -hmm. and i say this if we don't want the second colonization then we need to make sure we understand how the world works see i see a lot of africans young africans everything is external it's somebody else's fault this that that and when you ask them simple questions they don't know much about what they are talking about you see we we focus on fear mongering. See, all the things that, that has happened to Africa has happened to Africa. All the things that are still happening to Africa are happening to Africa. But for me, those things, irrespective of how, how they happened, how they are happening, if we do our own part, it, would, it doesn't matter. Anybody, see, there will never, never be a time where Africa, there are no external forces trying to take something from Africa. From Africa. There, is, there will never be a time. There will never be a time. So if we, we, we are waiting for the West to stop stealing from Africa, we we'll wait for the next uh, million million years, because I, I, as we say, the West has been stealing from Africa for for centuries now. Well, the truth of the matter is this: we have things that other people want. Okay, either we make it in a way to package it ourselves and tell them, okay, come and buy. If we don't educate ourselves to be able to do these things ourselves, if we don't educate ourselves to invite the kind of people we want to come and help us, mm -hmm. they will come and while we close our eyes, complain about everything, and they will steal those things. Mm. See, True. we complain a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, maybe in, in before before we got our independence. Okay. Yeah. We should, should complain to 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 so that our, our colonial masters can, can leave us alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not talking about uh, the the uh, former French colonies because France itself was still there. Okay, I'm happy 
that they're trying to drive France out. But for us, for us who were colonized by Britain, okay? Now, Britain left us, mostly left us. But then, how fast, how much development have we made? Have we created? Not a lot. Okay? So, because all of us, either French uh, former colonies or the, the former British colonies, all of us are complaining, complaining, complaining. Mm. And mm. so we all start educating ourselves. Now, there's something we, we, can, we need to say about that. Part of the reasons why the education hasn't gone the way it should be is because in my, in, in my mind, some of our leaders decide, have decided not to educate their people mm. for whatever reason. Mm. So we have that, that challenge. Okay? But then, uh, like you say, we need to take it seriously because mm. until we educate ourselves, we, con we, we will continue struggling. Mm. True. We Very true. Struggling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, you're very right. And uh... a few days ago, I saw a post of yours on LinkedIn that says, "Don't be a don't be a person, don't be a person of yesterday. Yeah, yesterday be a, person, a yeah. lifelong learner." Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you have already talked about that learning. Tell us a little bit more about it. I want you to encourage young Africans also to buy into this thing learning education okay so kindly please recommend five books just five yeah, five books that would be hard because eh? uh, the kind of books i read are weird um, no, see, one book see, I, see I i want to i want to read weird weird books please <laughs> that's what I, I i have a book called the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Okay. By Matt so, so Somebody recommended to a few seconds sessions ago. Yeah. It's a very good book. There's also a book called The Ascent of Money, a financial history of the world. That's by okay. Neil. Okay. The famous uh, scholar who predicted something wrongly about COVID. Ah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> financial history of the world is very good because. If you read that book, you'll know that everything that is happening now has been happening, happening yeah, from big from beginning. It's not it's so, nothing new. Everything is the same. So I've learned not to panic about anything again, right? Um there's also the Bible. The Bible is a very good book. I draw a lot of analogies from the Bible. Okay. And it's, it's something that we should read. You don't read the Bible once, you know, it's yeah. something you keep, it's a reference book. The Bible is a reference book. So the Bible is also a very, very, very good book. Okay. Another book that I like is The Secrets by Rhonda Bryan. Ah, okay. The Secret, yes. The Secrets is a very good book. Uh, it's a book everybody should read. Mm. Um, it, it just shows us, again, these are books that tell you that you whatever you want to be, you can do it for yourself. And that's yeah. the logic I mean, really. It's really about Africa and our destitution. Yeah. There's a book called Becoming Your Future. Sorry, Who Not How? Who Not How is by Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. Okay. And Who Not How is a very good book because it tells you that it's a book that promotes partnership, really. Mm. You can't. Mm. Part of the reasons we struggle is we try to do everything on our own instead of looking for who to help us. You yeah. Know? And yeah. Changes. So it's something, those are some of the books I recommend that anybody should read. Well done. Thank you very much for that. Now, for the last two questions, I'll, I'll, write, I'll roll them up into one. Okay. Mm -hmm. One, give advice to young people what can, so that they, they can do something to contribute to their society. And the second and last one, what 
is your vision for Africa in the next 30 years? Um, how can we contribute to our society? You know, just do any little good that you can. Any little good, no matter how little, even if it's as little as picking up a sheet of paper, picking up refuse on the road, you know, helping your brother or helping your sister. That's what we should do. It when people when you say when you bring this kind of question that talks about how can you contribute your quota, you know, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, oh, I need to do a big thing. Yeah. I need to do this. I don't have this. No, but start with what you have. So I tell people, I say, look, you have a voice, use it. You have hands. Well, what can you do with your hands? Um, what can you do with what you know? You know, sometimes people see me, they say, oh, Helen, you, you seem to be a very busy person. When do you have time to write? <laughs> I when I need to myself, not to anybody. It's, I, I started, I've been trying to write regularly, but I always fall off. But earlier this year, I made a promise that I want to write continuously for 30 days. I wow. couldn't. I said for seven days, I couldn't. <laughs> and then, and I do myself a challenge. And that came from finishing my thesis and appreciating the power of focus. Mm. Deciding to sort out the noise and focus on what's important to you. And I said, if I could do that, then I really have to bring make this part of my life. Yeah. Discipline. So I said, one area that I can start with is let me give myself a challenge of writing every day for 90 days. Wow. Yeah. And when, in fact, the first week was a struggle, you know, and I wanted to be writing at a particular time, you know. Ah, sometimes I'll be like, well, I don't feel like I said, no, 90 days. Go and write. All right. Go and do it. Right. And, you know, by the end of the first week, it started coming naturally that once I wake up, I write, and then I read my Bible. In fact, my U version, I've broken so many streaks, but as of today, I have not broken the streak of writing. I think today is wow. like my day one or something. So I've written every day for 115 days. And what that means, man. Yeah, what that means is when I started, I wanted to do 90 days. Then I listened to this gentleman who said he wrote on Quora for 360 days on gaming. I think gaming and programming. I can't remember. When I listened to him, I said, if this young man can do this, why can't let me extend this challenge to 365 days that I want to write every day for 365 days. So even after I achieved the 90 days, and I noticed that I, 90 days just two weeks ago, and I'm not beginning to feel like, I beg, I don't think I want to do it again. But I'm saying, you know, you have to do it because this is not about, <laughs> it's no longer just about writing. It's about discipline. Yeah, discipline. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I'm really looking for. So people say, ah, you write a lot. I smile. I say, these guys, they don't know. Me, I'm trying to discipline myself. Yeah. And, but then the unintended consequences is I'm getting followership on LinkedIn. People are calling me. Of course, you have to filter a lot of things yeah. uh, on social media because I have to do my work. But I just love the fact that I have stuck to one thing for so long. I've never been able to do it. So now if, if I can make it a part of me for one year, it will be a part of me for the rest of my life. Amen. See what see what what you're saying is very 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 important discipline. See if I tell you myself, that's part of what I'm struggling with. I'm struggling with it because yes, the things I want to discipline myself to do are difficult. Okay, mm -hmm. and because they're difficult, sometimes. You say, okay, let me just give this day. Let me not just do it for today. I'll catch up tomorrow. But once, once you, you fall off one day, the potentials for falling off the next day is high. Yes, very true. See, very I, true. I, I, I know that because, see, I've been struggling with something for 12 years. And yeah, I, I do it for 
maybe one month, two months, two months, three months. And then I'm, I'm it's so tiring. I say, okay, let me look, just leave you for today. Before I know it, it's two weeks. But I come back to do it again. Hey, mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. this is very mm -hmm. important. Now, tell us, what's your vision for Africa in the next 30 years? I want an Africa that works, an Africa that is improved, that has good functioning infrastructure, an Africa that is out of the poverty trap, an Africa that is no longer an orphan, an Africa that the world does not pity, you know, an Africa that is not the poor cousin of the rest of the world. That's the kind of Africa I want, you know. I want an Africa that can transform itself the way Indonesia did, the way Singapore did, the way Dubai did it. We we just Africa has to rise up to its potentials. That's the Africa I see, and that's why I do the kind of work I do now. Because the only way to get people to do things is to push them. So I, I want to be part of the people that will push Africa to success, that will say to Africa that, Africa, you can do it. Africa, you have to rise up and be a giant. You know, you have to, to add value to your resources. Your people have to be more resourceful. Your people have to be more productive. I, I said to, uh, I was talking to someone earlier today and I said, you know, why I do the kind of work I do is that, how can the Nigeria with 200 million people have a GDP of 340 billion. Somebody said, uh, well, was it you? Someone said, oh, if you remove all the informal sector, okay, it will be more yeah, than one no. trillion. Uh -huh, maybe it's not you. So, so that means the whole of the, uh, the whole of Africa, our GDP is one point something trillion, less than the GDP of three states in, uh, in America. Yeah. Why? Why, why should we be so low on productivity? Okay. So, so Lely, Lely, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you for last, last one. So for Africa to be what you envision, what, who are the people who will do it? Me yeah, and you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's close it. <laughs> okay. Let's close it. See, me and you. Okay. It's not, see, we can, you can invite other people from outside, but the people who are responsible for building the kind of Africa we want is you, me. Thank you. Yeah. Helen, I'm so happy. Thank you for being a great guest of the Think Big for Africa. Yeah, well done. This is a good, good very good idea. Thank you. And uh, I wish you more successes in Amen. the years ahead. Amen. I'm right. sure you asked me to tell that. <laughs> yes, sir. yes, sir. you come back someday, someday soon. All right, I definitely will. take care. Bye. Nice meeting you. Yeah.